So uh, thank you for joining us today, guys um, and girls. Um, if you ever dealt with big data, uh, I guess that you probably ask yourself how you can ingest terabytes of data and how you can make all this data available for customer facing dashboards. Um, and also you ask yourself how you can do all of that in a cost efficient manner, because in today's world, organization deeply care about the bottom line. So you came to the right place because this is exactly what we're going to discuss today. We've been using Apache Druid for the past six years and we used it for, for solving this exactly, this, this exact problems. And we will show, share with you how we did that in our uh, uh, presentation today. So before we start, just a short disclaimer. Uh, this presentation mostly covers advanced topics in Apache Druid, uh, but we still believe that it can be useful for broader audience. So no need to worry if you don't have previous experience with Apache Druid. Now, if you are looking for an introductory session about Apache Druid, you can check out our uh, presentation from Big Data London in 2019. You have the link here. And finally, uh, this presentation describes our journey while me and Itai worked at Nielsen. Okay. So my name is Yakir. I'm currently the co-founder and CEO at Cocoa BI. And, um, Previously, I was uh, leading the R&D for Nielsen Identity. I mainly focus on big data and machine learning solutions. And with me today, uh, Itai, who is currently a principal solutions architect, sorry, is a currently a senior solutions architect at Databricks. Previously, was a principal solutions architect at Imply. And before that, he was a big, a big data tech lead and worked with me at Nielsen. And as you can see, he has been dealing with big data challenges for quite some time now. Okay, so what we are going to discuss today. So first of all, we're gonna discuss data modeling and we're gonna, sh we're gonna show you how you should model your data, especially when you're gonna ingest it into Druid. Then we're gonna discuss data ingestion and we're gonna show you how to ingest terabytes and petabytes of data into Druid. Then we're going to discuss retention and deletion because um, ingesting data is very important and modeling is very important, but you also want to know when to delete your data and how to do that because you don't want to pay for data that you don't use. And finally, we're going to discuss query optimization and we're going to share with you tips and tricks on how to improve uh, your uh, Druid queries. And of course, that we're going to show you how to leverage all that knowledge in your organization. OK. So just um, some context before we jump into the technical details. Nielsen is a data and measurement company. Um, Nielsen is very famous for providing TV rating, especially in the United States, but they're doing this uh, globally. And the way that Nielsen does that is by collecting anonymous uh, data points from various sources, online sources, offline sources, panels. And the idea is to collect all these pieces of information and create a holistic view of a consumer. So basically Nielsen wants to create a profile for each consumer. And of course, again, we are talking about anonymous profiles. Nielsen does not collect PII or anything like that. So after, Generating these profiles, Nielsen uh, uh, can provide uh, uh, the data and the insights as part of the different measurement and targeting products uh, to its clients. Okay, and in Nielsen, we have a very extensive data infrastructure. In this presentation, we are focusing on the data infrastructure of Nielsen identity. And I want to share with you the numbers so you will see the, the scales that we need to handle. Uh, so we are processing or handling more than 10 billion events on a daily basis on our Kafka clusters. We are ingesting more than 60 terabytes on a daily basis uh, uh, into S3. In general, we have more than five petabytes of data on our data lake. And if we are talking about Spark, we are uh, uh, running more than 6,000 
Spark nodes on a daily basis. And finally, when talking about Druid, we are ingesting tens of terabytes of data into Druid on a daily basis. Now, we are doing all of that to solve multiple data problems. As I said, Mirsen has many data products and we need to process a lot of data and we have many uh, uh, data use cases. But in this presentation, uh, I want to focus on two use cases. The first use case is what we call building target audience. And the idea is that we want to provide our clients with the ability to define an audience. Audience is a definition uh, um, uh, that allow our clients to target specific group, group of devices or uh, people. And what they need to do is to define what is this audience, what are the attributes uh, uh, that uh, are part of this audience. So for example, if our client wants to build uh, an audience which targets all the females in a specific age with an interest in sports, for example, so we can do that by using this screen. So in this screen, what uh, uh, you, you see here, basically in the bottom part, we have a list of attributes. Again, attributes can be a gender, can be the age of a person or the age of the, the uh, person uh, uh, who is using the device. And uh, the client need to drag from the bottom part of the screen, the different attributes to the upper part of the screen. And when doing so, uh, basically, there is also a relation between the different attributes. So in the example here, uh, um, Itai, if you can go to the next slide, um, in the example here, what you, you see is that um, um, basically there is an audience definition of uh, uh, females in a specific age with a specific income uh, and a specific interest, for example. So as, again, as you can see, while dragging the different attributes, there is an end relation between the attributes and we need to calculate in real time the number of unique devices or unique person and show the result in the blue box at the top. So this is the first use case, uh, building target audiences. Now, the second use case that I want to uh, 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 present is uh, funnel analysis. Marketeers in general, need the ability to analyze the performance of their campaigns. They need to understand how many people reached each stage in the funnel. Like the best funnels are the funnels where uh, most people reach to the uh, final stage in the funnel. And essentially what marketeers wanna do is to compare the different funnels and understand which funnel produces the biggest number of purchases, for example. So our goal is to analyze the different stages uh, and report the number of unique persons that reached each stage in the funnel. And again, eventually what the marketer will do is we, it, it will take the uh, best performing funnel and will spend most of his money on this funnel. Okay. So as you've seen, um, we have diverse use cases. I presented only two, but as I said earlier, we have many more. And we wanted to find a single system that can help us solve these very different data problems. Now, we didn't want to have a dedicated system for each data problem, because then it means that our data infrastructure will get very complex. Instead, uh, we wanted to find a single system. Now, luckily for us, uh, Druid, because of its flexible architecture, the extensive query language, and also the ability to fine tune the system was a great fit. Now, if you also think about that, there is um, a common thread, a, a, a shared challenge in these problems. Essentially, what we are trying to do is to solve the count distinct problem. We are trying to find the number of unique elements, the number of unique devices, the number of unique persons. So this is a count distinct problem. And we try to do that in real time, because remember, we have a user that is waiting uh, in the screen, on the screen for an answer. So it cannot take minutes or even tens of seconds. Actually, even seconds, most of the time is uh, uh, too long. So we need to make this calculation very fast. And we also need to do that at scale because it, we need to scan a lot of data as you've seen in order to generate uh, or to find the, the right uh, answer. Now, unfortunately, if you 
try to solve the count listing problem, and you try to do that in real time and at scale, you will find out that there is no uh, space efficient and time efficient uh, uh, solution. And usually uh, what needs to be done is to use approximation algorithms. And in approximation algorithms, the idea is that um, you lose some of the accuracy. So you don't get, for example, the exact number of unique elements in a set. You get some estimation, which should be close enough. Now, in return for the loss of accuracy, you get significant improvements, both in the space required for the solution and in the time required for the solution. In our case, we chose Theta Sketch, which is based on the idea of K and V, K minimum values. K is some constant that uh, defines the number of elements you store in your sample. Again, when talking about approximation algorithms, you don't need to store all the elements uh, in the universe. You just store a sample of the universe. And by using K, uh, you also uh, control the uh, space required for the solution. So uh, higher K means that you will need more, uh, more space. You store more elements. And lower K means that you store less elements and thus you need uh, 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 less space. And minimum values refers to the process of choosing which elements uh, uh, you're gonna store in this uh, sample. Now, with Theta Sketch and KMV, uh, you basically uh, um, can uh, estimate set cardinality, which means that you can get the number of unique elements in a set. And for us, the biggest benefit of Theta Sketch and KMV was its great support for set theoretic operations, which means that we could we still can calculate the intersection between two sets and also the union between two sets. And again, this is very important for us, especially if we go back to the first uh, use case where we had to define an audience. Again, audience is a composition of different attributes and a relation between them. So this is equivalent to uh, uh, um, uh, set theoretic operations. Now, the only downside uh, that we found with Theta Sketch was when we tried to intersect a very small set with a very big set. Now, this is a known problem uh, uh, of these algorithms. And Itai will uh, share with you some uh, uh, ways to mitigate uh, this specific problem. OK, so we decided, or uh, uh, we understood that we need to use Theta Sketch. But we had to find a concrete implementation uh, uh, of Theta Sketch. And luckily for us, Theta Sketch is being supported in Druid via the great data, data sketches library by Yao. And the way that it works is that during ingestion time, the different sketches are being created based on the configuration and stored as Druid segments. And then during query time, the different sketches are being pulled from the segments. There is an initial aggregation that is being performed. And then based on your configuration and whether you need a union operation or intersection operation, there is a post aggregation phase. And uh, the final result is the uh, uh, estimated uh, uh, number uh, that this final aggregated sketch represents. Now, this was a very basic explanation about KMV, Theta Sketch, and in general how it works in Druid. Um, but if you want to learn more and uh, understand maybe how uh, uh, KMV and Theta Sketch works behind the scenes, I encourage you to go and watch these short videos that we created a few years ago. Um, OK. So we uh, discussed the count distinct problem. We understood that this is a very difficult problem to solve, um, especially when you try to do that in real time and at scale. We also said that Theta Sketch can help us solve this problem and that Druid supports Theta Sketch. But now we have to build a full pipeline that combines all this knowledge and convert it into a solution. And this is exactly uh, what Itai will uh, show you. Thank you. Thanks, Akir. So uh, what I'm going to do in, in the next slides is go through the high-level overview of our data pipeline and focus on the main uh, four areas that Akir mentioned when we started the presentation, meaning data modeling, data ingestion, 
retention and deletion, and uh, query performance and optimization. So let's start with uh, data modeling. So here's a very uh, uh, made up example of a Druid data source or a Druid table. Um, as you probably know, there's a timestamp column like this timestamp column here. There is a dimension, uh, a string dimension called audience name, which is again, representative of the audience that you mentioned earlier. And we also have another column of the device ID, which is the device ID that we identified this audience uh, in, uh, for in this given date. Now, I call it the naive approach because if you want to uh, know how many unique devices uh, were, for example, tablets and used in a given date, we'll uh, have to do a, a kind of non-efficient operation uh, such as table scan. A more efficient approach to those count distinct problem uh, or count distinct queries would be uh, to introduce data sketch and leverage the data sketches library that Ikir talked about. So rather than having the rather than having the device ID column, we'll have a data sketch metric. And then if we want to know how many tablets were used in a given date, we only need to take this data sketch metric and extrapolate uh, the ex uh, approximated number of unique devices. That's very cool, very efficient. However, uh, what about uh, the uh, kind of edge case of data sketch where we would need to intersect a very large set, for example, tablet devices, with a very small set? So as we know, uh, unfortunately for us, the read committers, uh, there's only, ha only handful of those or, or, or something like that. So intersecting uh, these two uh, data sketch metrics would most likely result in a very high error rate. So one way to mitigate that, and that's exactly what we did, is we extracted the device type into a new dimension. And then if we want to know uh, how many uh, uh, tablets were, use, uh, were used by Druid committers on a given date, there's no intersection, no, nothing like that. We only have one data sketch metric that we need to address and extrapolate the approximated number of unique devices from. Cool. Um, another thing would be uh, slowly changing dimensions. Suppose we want to change this audience name from football fans to American football fans, because as we all know, uh, football and American football are not the same. So with the naive approach, uh, in order to change it, we'd probably have to re-index the entire data source or find some kind of workaround in order to apply this change. However, a better approach would be to leverage uh, what is called in Druid lookups. And so lookups are sort of uh, uh, mapping between some kind of arbitrary ID, like this audience ID in this column, and some kind of string like the audience name in this column. This mapping can be stored in a table in a relational database or in a file. And then the Druid processes that are serving queries will load that mapping in a background thread into their memory and use it when serving queries. In our uh, uh, data sources or in our fact tables, what we'll then store is rather than the uh, audience name, we'll only store this arbitrary audience ID. So it will be uh, more efficient. But then you probably ask yourself, well, that doesn't really help us much uh, when we need to serve uh, customer facing dashboards because customers don't know and don't care what is this uh, arbitrary ID, right? We need to show them the actual audience name. And so to do that, you can either use the uh, lookup SQL function or do a simple join between this data source and the lookup table in order to present the actual audience name. And finally, when we want to apply such a change, like I mentioned, there's only one place where we need to apply it. And this is uh, in the origin of this lookup. So it can be, again, the uh, origin, uh, the original uh, relation and database table or the original file. So to summarize the data model section, we talked about uh, how you can use data sketch for fast and efficient count distinct uh, queries. Uh, and we told you you need to pay attention to intersections. We showed you how you can leverage lookups to handle slowly changing dimensions. And we also encourage you to check out the schema design page on Druid's website to get more guidelines around that. So after we model the data, let's see how we can ingest data into Druid. And Druid supports uh, a few ingestion methods, such as streaming or real-time ingestion, uh, for example, through Kafka or Kinesis. And also support uh, batch ingestion, uh, such as the Adobe-based ingestion or the native batch ingestion. I guess it might not be a surprise that we chose the Adobe-based ingestion. Uh, and let's see why. So 
first of all, there were technical considerations. You can mention that we started off three years ago. And at that point, the Adobe's ingestion was the mature approach to ingest data into Android. Uh, second of all, it's very scalable. So if uh, in a given point in time or in a given day, I have uh, spikes in the incoming data, or uh, I have much less data than I expected, I can either scale up or scale down my Hadoop, rep, uh, my Hadoop MapReduce cluster in order to accommodate uh, to the volume of the incoming data. There's also uh, a consideration uh, or kind of business requirements relevant here. So we are talking about analyzing big data trends, such as campaign trends, stuff like that. So uh, the resolution or the granularity of the data we're talking about is one day. And thus ingesting the data once a day in a batch kind of fashion, or even a few times a day, was uh, good enough for us. Now, the Adobe ingestion is still uh, widely used among the, the Druid community. And so we want to share with you a few tips around that. First of all, uh, many times you'd want to ingest uh, data in parallel uh, through separate Hadoop clusters to separate or to different data sources in Druid. And you can achieve that using what is called affinity. Affinity is a mapping between a middle manager and a data source. And so what you can do is you can uh, launch multiple Hadoop clusters, point each one of them to its own middle manager, and in, uh, that ingestion task will ingest data to the data source that is pointed by that meter manager. Another thing that's very useful is uh, masking sensitive properties in the ingestion task logs. So think about your passwords, your you know, AWS credentials, et cetera. You, you can do that using the Druid startup logging mask properties configuration property. Now, uh, at least uh, uh, in the first few times you use it, I suggested to you, um, Check the ingestion task logs to know uh, to uh, understand uh, which sensitive information uh, may still be uh, logged, even if this is uh, enabled. Now, uh, talking about the the, the MapReduce uh, ingestion task, essentially it runs two MapReduce jobs by default. The first one is called determined partitions, uh, and essentially what it does is based on the target rows per segment property, it scans the entire incoming data and determines how many partitions or shards or segments those words can be used interchangeably uh, needs to be uh, need to be created from that ingestion task. The second MapReduce job is called index partitions, which basically based on the number that was found in the first job will uh, produce X uh, segments. Now, in case you know in advance uh, the volume of your incoming data, or if the uh, volume of your incoming data is quite fixed, what you can do to significantly speed up your ingestion is rather than using the target rows per segment, you can set num shards in advance in your partition spec. Uh, this will basically skip the determined partitions altogether and use these num shards as the input to the second job and only run that. Even so, MapReduce job can still be quite slow. And one way to optimize that is by pre-aggregating the data in an upstream process, if this is applicable for you. So for example, what we did is, uh, as I showed you earlier in our data pipeline, we have a Spark application uh, that, that uh, uh, is upstream and, and runs before the Hadoop MapReduce ingestion. And so in that Spark application, we not only transform the data, but we also apply some partial aggregations and we write theta sketch objects di directly from the Spark application. And then we set the is input theta sketch uh, config property to true in the Hadoop ingestion task in order for that to identify uh, that the input is uh, theta sketch objects. And again, it can significantly improve the uh, speed of your ingestion. So to summarize the ingestion section, we talked about the multiple options that exist. Uh, we explained why we chose the Hadoop based ingestion and we showed you some uh, guidelines in order to optimize that using things like affinity to ingest data in parallel, uh, uh, using num shards versus target rows per segment, and also pre-aggregating the data upstream. Now, another thing I want to point out is this uh, uh, issue on Druid's GitHub repo. Uh, it's currently a work in progress by the community, uh, specifically led by a great uh, guy uh, named uh, Julian Jaffe. And it uh, goes around uh, ingesting data directly from Spark into Druid. And so when uh, eventually this will be merged, it will allow you to skip the Adobe ingestion altogether. Now, after we modeled the data and we ingested it, it's very important to understand uh, uh, how and what we want to retain and delete. So we want to store uh, redundant data and we, want, we will not pay for redundant data. 
So when talking about uh, retention and deletion, there are three terms you need to be familiar with. The first one is load rules. And those lo uh, rules determine which segments should be loaded into the cluster, meaning being copied from the query deep storage into the local disks of the uh, machines in the cluster. And this is done by interval or by period. Uh, for example, last 30 days. They also determine how many replicas per segment will be copied uh, into the cluster. Now, the flip side of that are drop rules, which determine when segments should be dropped from the cluster, but not yet deleted completely from, from deep storage. In order to completely and permanently delete all information about the segment and remove it from deep storage, you need to leverage kill tasks. Now, it's very important to understand that Druid segments, those uh, binary files in Druid format, uh, have versions, meaning whenever we uh, ingest data for a time interval that already have existing segments, new versions of those segments will be created. Now, um, while all versions of all segments take up space in deep storage, the fact is only the latest version of each segment is actually being used, and it's marked with used equals one in the metadata store. Now, what we uh, really suggested to do uh, within your kill task is to specify the, the kill task interval as wide as possible. Now, don't be afraid to do that because it will only delete those segments that are marked as unused, meaning used equals zero. They are not used for serving queries, and thus it's okay to delete them. And why is it so important? Let's see a real world example. So we had uh, one of our data sources, which had one year retention period, meaning we wanted to serve queries up to the last year. And we were using, uh, we are using uh, AWS S3 as our deep storage. Now, initially our kill task interval was everything older than 30 days, meaning we deleted all versions that were marked as unused and were older than 30 days. It required over 350 terabytes in our deep storage, and it cost us over $8,000 a month. Now, by only changing the kill task interval to uh, all unused versions that are older than two days, again, we, we didn't hear any functionality. We're still serving queries up to the last year, but only the unused versions older than two days are deleted. We reduced the used storage to only 15 terabytes and the cost per month to only $350. So we're talking about over 95% improvement for a single data source. Another very cool thing uh, we, uh, we are doing, and you can also uh, implement, is dimension-based TTL. Now, Druid, as any probably any other database out there, uh, allows you to do TTL or time to live of data based on some, some kind of timestamp column like this timestamp column here. But uh, let's consider this GDPR-like use case where uh, you have uh, uh, data uh, from both US, uh, from both US and uh, EU countries like Sweden. Suppose you can, uh, you're allowed uh, in terms of regulations to store up to 90 days worth of data from US, but only up to 30 days worth of data from EU countries like Sweden. As you can see at the moment in this made up example, we have uh, data older than 30 days for both countries. Now, what if we want to add new data for today, uh, for today, for example, and we want to delete only data that is uh, other than 30 days for Sweden. Meaning we'll get, uh, we are aiming for this result, right? So we deleted everything older than 30 days for Sweden and we added new data for both US and Sweden. So the way to do it is uh, using the Hadoop as ingestion and uh, leveraging the multi-type input spec. What it does, it allows you to combine other input specs. So you can uh, take new data uh, from S3, for example, and combine it with, with existing data in your data source. And then in the type data source, you can actually use a filter as part of the ingestion spec, so you can filter in or filter out uh, data as needed. Now, that's, again, it's a very high level description, but my colleague and I wrote a blog post that goes thoroughly into the details of that, and you can check it out in this link. So to summarize the retention deletion section, we talked about load and drop rules as a way to load and drop segments from the cluster. We talked about kill task as a way to permanently delete uh, versions or unused versions of segments. And I showed you how to do the mention based TTL. And now finally, after we modded the data, ingested it and managed to retain and delete it, let's talk about querying it. So Druid uh, supports uh, two query methods. One is the native query uh, language, which is JSON based. And the other one is Druid SQL. Uh, again, maybe not surprised we chose the native query language because first, Druid SQL didn't even exist yet when we started off with Druid SQL. Uh, however, Druid SQL is exp expanding rapidly with each version, so 
Querying data sketches from SQL was added way back in 014. The union all operator was added in, zero, uh, in Druid 020. And new aggregations such as array arg and string arg are actually, have actually been released uh, earlier today uh, as part of the Druid 022 uh, release um, that was announced um, a few hours ago. That's why today you'd probably want to start with Druid SQL if you're starting off with Druid. Now, we're talking about Druid as a way to, to do very fast queries, sub-second queries. So we want to tune our uh, queries for performance. Now, the focus of uh, uh, the presentation was Theta Sketch, and Yaku mentioned the K from KMV as the size of the sample we will store in our sketches. Uh, this size is something we can control as part of the ingestion and the querying uh, as a, 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 and queries. Now, queries with relatively high size, like uh, 65,000, are heavy on resources, thus they will take more time. Uh, it can be a few more milliseconds or a few uh, dozen milliseconds, but still more time. Now, uh, switching to a uh, more moderate size, like uh, uh, 4,000, can significantly improve your speed, uh, especially when there are no intersections, uh, so there is a relatively small effect on accuracy. On the flip side of that is actually tuning tether sketch size for accuracy, because sometimes you just want your queries to be more accurate. Now, this is a real world example for one of our data sources. You can see we're using the SQL, the SQL, uh, um, SQL here. Uh, we're using the approximate count distinct DS theta function, and we provide the name of the data sketch metric, in our example, user ID sketch. We select uh, the data from a data source called the campaign uh, 1429, and we provide some kind of criteria, and the result was uh, somewhat over 300, uh, 3,500,000. Now, by only slightly changing uh, this query and providing a second argument to this function, uh, which um, has 65,000, we got a, a result that's about 3,000 uh, higher uh, than the previous result, and I can assure you it's more accurate. And the reason it's more accurate is because this approximate count, uh, approximate count distinct this theta function has an optional argument of size, which is often overlooked. It defaults to 16,000. That's why when we didn't provide anything, we got a result that's quite accurate, but not as accurate as we got when we provided 65,000 as the size argument. So to summarize the query section, we showed you the two query methods uh, that you can use when querying Druid. We explained why we chose native queries, but why you'd probably want to go with Druid SQL. And we showed you how to tune Theta Sketch to balance between performance and accuracy. Now the same, uh, issue I mentioned earlier in the Druid GitHub repo uh, that will allow you to eventually uh, ingest data directly from Spark will also allow you eventually to query data directly from deep storage using Spark. Uh, this slide is, is very, uh, I think, uh, very useful because uh, this question comes up uh, really uh, often in various Druid forums. And it's the question of read-only cluster or how do I set, set up a read-only cluster? So setting up a read-only cluster uh, is doable by pointing uh, the read-only cluster to the same deep storage as your operational cluster. It allows you to, uh, you need to create, sorry, a read and write role for the operational cluster, which will allow you to ingest new data from that cluster. And you also create a read-only role for the read-only cluster, which will prevent you from accidentally ingesting new data. Then all you need to do is to periodically restore the metadata store, uh, for example, your MySQL or, or Postgre, from the operational store uh, cluster backup, to the read-only cluster uh, metadata store, and you're done. You get a read-only cluster with a relatively low uh, operational overhead. So basically what we showed you is how you can ingest terabytes of data, use it for customer-facing dashboards, and do all that in a cost-efficient manner. Just before we wrap things up, a few things we care about. Women in Big Data is a worldwide program that aims to inspire, connect, grow, and champion the success of women in the big data and analytics field. There are over 17,000 members worldwide, and everyone can join regardless of gender. So we encourage you to find a chapter near you using this Women in Big Data website. There are a couple of past talks that uh, will uh, help you. And one of them is the Druid intro session from Big Data London 2019 that you mentioned. And the other one is a talk I gave uh, with my colleague at the recent Data and AI Summit 2021 about final analysis with Apache Spark and Druid. We also mentioned blog posts, so there are two blog posts that uh, you can use. 
The first one is the data retention deletion Apache Druid. And the other one is kind of uh, uh, the part two of this post and is more focused about data deletion. Uh, it's also worth noting that Druid, the Virtual Druid Summit uh, 2021 will be taking place in uh, November uh, 9th and 10th. And the CFP is still open until uh, the end of September. Cool. So that's it for us. We'll be taking questions now. And we really thank you for joining us today. Uh, feedback, your feedback is really important for us. So really feel free to reach out to Yakir and myself and provide us with your insights and thoughts about this talk. Thanks, everyone. Cool. So uh, this is your time to ask. We have a few more uh, minutes for questions. Um, can you share the link? Yeah, of course, uh, Javier. We will share the, the entire presentation um, later, I guess, in a few weeks. But let Maybe, me copy the... Yeah. Yeah. Just share the link in the chat. Yeah. OK, so this is the link. Uh, and also, uh, if we have uh, one more minute, I will share with you. Oops. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, another uh, bonus slide. Um, unless someone has a question, let me check. Uh, no questions in the Q&A. Again, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. But until you do, I will um, we'll share one last bonus slide. Um, yep. So hardware. Uh, there's always the question of how you uh, spec your uh, Druid cluster. And so there are different considerations when you choose your hardware, right? So cost, performance, usage patterns. Here's an uh, actual example for one of our from one of our Druid cluster, or one of our production clusters. Uh, we have less than ten data sources in that cluster. All are using TetaSketch. The data size on that cluster is about forty-five terabytes. And again, this is the uh, compressed, aggregated, compacted data, right? The raw data, as you mentioned, is uh, a few petabytes. Uh, we are using AWS, so we chose uh, five broker nodes of R4 ATX large. Uh, each one has 32 cores and uh, 244 gigabytes of RAM. And for historicals, we have 25 i3 ATX large, which are similar in terms of cores and RAM, but also have very fast uh, SSDs to allow us to serve queries faster. So that's uh, another cool thing uh, we wanted to share with you. OK. Last minute for questions. As I hear, uh, and I mentioned, uh, it's, it's OK. Uh, we know, uh, you know no one wants to start with a question. Oh, question. Yeah, thank you, Ivan Evans, for, uh, for your question. In practice, for sketching, what if the num of actual count is really low? And it's making okay. That's a good question. Um, you care to want to take it or? Yeah. Um, if the number of actual count is lower than k, so for example, let's say that you define k equals to uh, thirty-two thousand, and the actual count, the actual number of elements uh, in your uh, uh, sketch is lower than that, you you don't lose any any accuracy. Basically, you get the exact number because then there is no sense. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good point, uh, Evans. I hope, hope uh, that that uh, explanation is is uh, good enough. But the thing is that if that you store up to k uh, elements in your sample, so if you have less than k elements, suppose your k is I don't know sixty five thousand like we have. So if you have only I don't know a thousand uh, uh, elements in your incoming uh, set, then you would just store all those uh, thousand elements, and there's no estimation basically. Uh, Mark Andre, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, asked, how do you access historic data? Good question. So um, the way Druid works, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much, I, I hope I um, uh, understand the question correctly. But the way Druid works is uh, you can store all your historic data, in, or you basically do it in two places. So you store it in the deep storage, which in our example is S3. But you also load it using those load rules I mentioned into the local disk of your uh, Druid cluster. And so those uh, that historic data, for example, in our case, is the last year or sometimes even last few years, is kept also on the local disk so you can query it at all times. Um, you can, if you want, um, 
keep it only on deep storage. And then uh, let's say you need it only once a month for some kind of report, or I don't know what. So what you can do is store it only on the deep storage, don't have and not have a load rule that will automatically load it all the time. Uh, but then only uh, that once a month that you need it, uh, apply a load rule that will load it. It will take some time depending on the size of the data. And then one, once you're done with it, you can uh, use draw pools to drop it. Uh, but if you need to access it all the time, then you just need uh, to have it both in deep storage and in the disk of your uh, disks of the local uh, machines in the cluster. I hope that answered the questions. Awesome. Great. So um, great questions. Uh, again, we really appreciate uh, you know uh, the, the all all the participation today, and. Um, if you want to reach us out on Twitter and LinkedIn, um, feel free. Uh, you can find us both. We'll be happy to follow up and hear your feedback and your thoughts. And just to uh, you know, um, chat with the community. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Bye bye.